wondering if you're acquainted with the story of Hank and the mop bucket. Maybe you are and just don't know it. Hank is a 80-year-old retired professional who supplements his fixed income with night shift custodial work. His health isn't what it used to be. Gout keeps him awake at night, arthritis makes him limp. His glasses are so thick that his eyeballs look twice their size. His shoulders stoop, but still he does his work. Slopping soapy waters on linoleum, scrubbing the heel marks left by the well-heeled lawyers. He'll be finished an hour before quitting time. He always is, has been for years, always finishes early, but he never leaves early. He'll put away his bucket and take a seat outside the office of the senior partner and he'll wait. He could leave early. No one would know, but he doesn't. He broke the rules once, never again. Sometimes if the door is open, he'll wander into the office of the senior partner and just take a look. The, uh, the office is <laughs> twice the size of his apartment. He'll run his finger over the desk and he'll stroke the leather couch. He'll stand at the window and watch the gray sky turn gold and he'll remember. He once had such an office back when, <laughs> back when he was Henry. Back when the custodian was an executive, long ago, before the night shift, before the mop bucket, before the maintenance uniform, before the scandal, Hank made a mistake he could never forget. It was a grave mistake. Hank killed someone. He came upon the thug beating up an innocent man and he lost control. And when word got out, Hank got out, he'd rather hide than go to jail, so he ran, then the executive became a fugitive. That was years ago. It's a true story. True story made even more dramatic by the incident with the mop bucket. At first, he thought it was just a joke. Some of the fellows on the third floor played these kind of tricks. He heard a voice coming out of the mop bucket. Henry? Henry? Hank turned. No one called him Henry anymore. Henry? Henry? And he stepped toward the pail. It was glowing, bright red, hot red he could feel the heat 10 feet away he stepped forward and looked in the water wasn't boiling but the pot was hot how could it be this is strange he mumbled to himself as he as he took another step closer to get a closer look this time the voice stopped him don't come any closer take off your shoes where you stand is holy ground. And suddenly Hank knew who was speaking. You think I'm making this up, don't you? Sounds crazy, almost irreverent. God speaking from a mop bucket to a janitor named Hank? Well, would it be more believable if I told you it was God speaking through a burning bush? To a shepherd named Moses. Just because we're familiar with the story doesn't make it any more spectac less spectacular than it was the day it first happened in the wilderness with the 80 year old shepherd. By now, however, we're starting to grow accustomed to spectacular stories, aren't we? As a congregation, all of our campuses are working through. The story, it's a chronological Bible in which each week we read another major section as God leads us down his divine timeline. We began just a few weeks ago looking at the creation and then the ensuing fall of Adam and Eve and then the flood of Noah and the creation of the Tower of Babel. 
The next chapter introduced us to Abram and Sarai, or as they came to be known as Abraham and Sarah. Who would have thought that they would receive a baby about the same time they were receiving Social Security, but they did. And consequently, the nation of Israel was born when Isaac was born. And then came last week's chapter, the story of Joseph. Joseph, the great-grandson of Abraham, sold down the river by his brothers, sent into Egyptian slavery himself. But then God turned that prisoner into a prince. And in doing so, actually saved not just the Jewish people, but the lineage of Jesus Christ. And we're beginning to catch a hint of how what God is doing up there and what we're seeing down here don't seem like they match up, but God is always up to something good, even if it might be difficult for us. Well, 400 years pass, and the children of Israel, the Hebrew nation, is still in Egypt. But the favor, the favor of Pharaoh that was upon Joseph has long since passed, and there is no favor upon the Hebrew people. Just the opposite, the Egyptians resent the presence of the Hebrews and are concerned because the nation just continues to grow, so they inaugurate the first genocide. And the firstborn of every Hebrew family is to be killed. It was this world that welcomed the baby Moses. It was into this world that Moses was born, and it was in the chaos of this world that Moses received the call. You might remember his story. He was adopted nobility. He was an Israelite reared in an Egyptian palace. His his countrymen were slaves, but Moses was privileged. He ate at the royal table. He was educated in the finest schools. But his most influential teacher had no degree. It was his mother. Remember how when he was plucked out of the Nile River, there appeared a young lady and the Egyptians asked her to be the nanny for the baby, not knowing that she was the biological mother. And so she raised Moses. And don't you know, she prayed for Moses. And don't you know, there were times in which she looked into the face of her young son and said, now don't forget who you are. God is going to use you for something special. Don't forget who you are. And he didn't forget The flame of justice grew within his heart brighter and brighter until that one day when he was 40 years old, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and Moses intervened and killed the Egyptian. Knowing that spelled the end for him, Moses fled and ended up in the wilderness, and that's where he spent the next 40 years. He assumed, I would imagine, that he would never come back to Egypt. We can call that a serious career shift. He went from sitting with heads of state to counting the heads of sheep. And by the time he was 80 years old, he had spent four decades in the wilderness, never thinking he would ever go back to Egypt. And we knew that, we know that because when God came to him, not through a mop bucket, but through a burning bush and spoke to him, uh, Moses was resistant. Moses said to him, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I know how I would answer that question. Who are you? Well, you're the You're the young man who grew up, the Hebrew who was trained by the Egyptians. You're the one who speaks perfect Egyptian. You're the one who understands the science and the language. You're the one who has set in on the cabinet decisions. You're the one who has instant access to Pharaoh. You are the perfect one to go back. And then I would have said, and you're the one that has been trained for the last 40 years in the very wilderness through which you are going to lead the Hebrew people. You know every cave and every lizard and every snake. You've had 40 years of training in Egypt. You've had 40 years of training in the wilderness. You're the perfect one for this job. I would have made a big deal out of Moses. 
But God doesn't mention Moses. All he does is tell Moses his name. You want to know how you're going to get through this, Moses? Here's the way God answers that question. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. Just, I am has sent me to you. We know many titles of God, but this is the name of God, the self-assigned name of God, Yahweh, Yahweh. It comes from a confluence of two Hebrew verbs, I am and I cause to be, Yahweh. Just tell them I am sent you. If you come up to me today and say, Max, how are you doing? And I say, I am. You're going to say, finish the sentence. Because we don't get by with saying, I am. Because we change. We change from year to year, from month to month, from day to day, even from minute to minute. How are you? I'm... I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, I'm cranky, I'm fine. We have to finish the sentence because we're always changing. The point, God never changes. He's the only one who ever said, I am who I am and got by with it. The reason you're going to do this, Moses, the reason you're going to succeed in this, Moses, is because I am I am strong, I am faithful, I am good. Everything God has ever been is everything he will ever be. And the power, Moses, does not rely upon you, Moses. But the power relies upon me. What matters, Moses, is not your ability, but your availability. Some of you need to hear that. You're saying, I'm not up to being a parent. I don't think I can save my marriage. I'm not sure I can hang it in, hang in it with these employees or employers. I'm not sure I have the patience. I'm not sure I have the wisdom. I'm afraid I'm too old. I'm afraid I'm too young. I'm afraid, and then we begin to fill in the blanks. And God's response to us is the same response he gave to Moses. It really doesn't matter about you. What matters is that you lean into me, and I am. Lloyd Douglas was the author of the novel, The Robe, and several other classics. And he relates how when he was in college, he stayed in a, in a boarding house of sorts and was on the second floor. And the first floor, uh, there was a, a retired music professor who was wheelchair bound. And the two struck up a friendship. And every day, Lloyd Douglas would, would stop and poke his head in the doorway of the apartment of the retired music professor and he would say what's the good word prof and every day the professor would pull from his shirt pocket a tuning fork now you got to be pretty old to know what a tuning fork is so a tuning fork predates the pitch pipe and he would take that tuning fork and he would hit it against the metal part of his wheelchair and he would put it up to his ear and let it vibrate and he would say to young Lloyd, that, my friend, is a middle C. The tenor upstairs sings flat. The piano across the hallway is out of tune. But that's still a middle C. That's the good news. What's the point? It's good that there's a middle C in the world. It's good that there's something that doesn't change. Listen, you and I live in a changing world. It's changing so fast we can scarcely keep up with it. I'm still trying to figure out how to operate a fax machine, and it's already out of date. <laughs> it's moving. The economy's changing. The political landscape is changing. The geopolitical world is changing. 
Even churches change. Add to that, you're changing. Hair's growing where it didn't used to. <laughs> things are getting bigger, things are getting smaller. You're forgetting, you're remembering it, that you're changing. And you're married to someone who's changing. You're raising kids that are changing. You have parents who are changing. It's a changing world. Listen, change will freak us out unless we lock into the unchanging hand of the mighty I am, Yahweh. It seems to me God was saying to Moses, you're about to lead a nation through change. And what you need to know is that I don't. I don't. And the same God who was yesterday is a God who is tomorrow is a God who is always. You need an unchanging God in a changing world. Well, after some more talk, Moses said yes. We got to move quickly through this dramatic back and forth between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses would say, let my people go. Pharaoh would say no, but then would come a plague. And then Moses and then Pharaoh would weaken and, and he would say yes. And then Moses would begin to say, I'm going to get the people and Pharaoh would resist. And it was just back and forth and back and forth. There were one, one plague after the other. I listed them here. Maybe you've read about them. The river became blood, then frogs, gnats, flies, disease in the livestock, boils, storms, locusts, darkness. Every time there was a display of God's power, the people began to understand the mighty power of God. But Pharaoh would resist until finally the, the sign, the moment that changed everything. And it was through this final plague, through this final sign, that God revealed his plan of redemption. Redemption. God told Moses to instruct every family to take an unblemished lamb, to kill it and apply some of the blood to the doorpost of the home. Let me just read it to you. I'm in Exodus chapter 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. What a strange command what an eerie night hebrews who indwelt that part of the city where the road was muddy and the huts were small the hebrews slaughtered the lambs and the leader of each house with a bowl full of blood and a brush took that blood and took that brush and dipped the second into the first and he streaked across his doorway across the entry way to his house a slash of crimson and then at midnight at midnight firstborns where there was no slash of blood in the home's where there had been no mark over the doorway. That's when the firstborns took their final breath. Fathers heard their sons gasp. Wives heard their husbands gasp. What an eerie, bone-chilling night of ebon sorrow. Only the blood-covered homes were spared. Now, why were the Hebrew people spared? Why? Those over whom the angel of death passed, why were they spared? Was it because they were Hebrews? Was it because they knew Moses? No, it had nothing to do with who they were. It had nothing to know with who they knew. It had everything to do with where they were. They were beneath the blood of the Lamb. They had positioned themselves in a place where they were beneath the blood of the Lamb. 
question. Had you been there, had you been one of those Hebrew families, would you have obeyed that command? Would you? Had you been told to take a lamb, a spotless lamb, and, 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 and sacrifice the lamb and then take the blood and, and put it over the entryway, to, would you have done it? Or would you have said, that's the craziest thing I think I've ever heard? You see, no one had ever done anything like that before. As far as I can tell, that was the first and final time that command was ever given in Scripture. Would you have done it? It's more than a rhetorical question. Because you see, you and I have the same problem that the Hebrews had in Egypt, and that is we are enslaved. We are enslaved. Not to Pharaoh, but to sin. We do the very thing we say we'll never do. We try to run the world ourselves. We keep climbing up in the throne telling God to get lost, maybe not with our words, but certainly with our actions and our thoughts. We're enslaved to sin. And we don't need somebody just to help us. We need someone to deliver us. We need someone to walk us out. We need somebody to redeem us. And so as far back as even in the story of Moses, we begin to see God's plan of redemption. It involves the shedding of blood and the arrival of a lamb. You remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus Christ? He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you remember how the Apostle Paul described the role of Jesus Christ? He called Jesus Christ our Passover Lamb who has been sacrificed. You see, you and I need exactly what the Hebrew people needed. We need somebody to rescue us. And so God gives us a perfect lamb, Jesus Christ. And we position ourselves not beneath the blood-stained doorway of a house in Egypt, but we position ourselves beneath the blood-covered cross of Jerusalem. And we stand there. And we trust in the ability of God to save us, to lead us out. Isn't it amazing how the story of the gospel is appearing all the way back in the days of Abraham and Joseph and Moses? And that crimson thread which begins in the Garden of Eden is running all the way through the story of the Bible into the book of Revelation. Every story works together to tell us that we need somebody to deliver us. And we don't need a Moses, but we need a Jesus Christ. So the question is more than rhetorical, and I'll ask you again. If invited to position yourself beneath the covering of the Lamb designated by God, would you do so? Have you done so? The vast majority of the people in the world right now say that's the most foolish thing I've ever
vast majority of the people in the world say, I don't even need someone to die for my sin because I ain't half bad. I'm a pretty good person. But when Jesus Christ came onto the planet as the only perfect person who has ever lived, we realize that compared to him, we all fall short. Have I told you about how my mother used to tell me to clean up my room? And I would always point to my brother's bedroom that was messier than mine. Because it was. I'm a recovering slob. He's a slob addict. And I'd say, Mom, look at my brother's room. And she'd say, it's not his room. You come and look at my room. Boy. She put neat on neat. She would lead me into her room where every wrinkle was removed from every part of the bed. No shoe was out of place and every piece of clothing was hung up. She said, this is what I call neat. When the king of kings sent his son to live the perfect life on this earth. Gone forever was the excuse that says, well, compared to him or compared to them, I'm pretty decent. And God points at Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb, and says, now that's what I call perfection. And wise is the person who says, then I need help. I need deliverance. You know, as far as we know, every Hebrew family accepted God on his offer. As far as we know. And they allowed God to lead them out, lead them through the Red Sea out of Egypt. (laughs) But somewhere between the Red Sea and the Jordan River, they got cold feet. You see, it was God's plan to lead them straight out of Egypt into the promised land. But somewhere between the Red Sea and the Jordan River, they forgot. That's a story for next week. We can't go that far today. But we can walk away with a couple of takeaway messages from Moses' story thus far. First of all, would you receive again the call of God? Would you? Would you? Maybe you are where Moses was. Maybe you feel like you're too old, or or maybe you feel like you did the wrong thing. Maybe you've been off the grid. Maybe you've been out of the loop. Maybe you've been out in the sticks. Maybe you feel like you're too weak or too sinful or, or, or whatever. To you, God says what God said to Moses. What matters not is who you are. What matters is who I am. What matters is not your ability, but your availability. Never has the old saying been more true than it is with Moses. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He qualifies us. Now, we know this is true for you because of promises that we have like this one in the book of Philippians. God began doing a good work in you, and I am sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. I ask you, has Jesus Christ come again? Has he? You can say no if you want. At least we hope he hasn't, right? We're left behind. He has not come back. So... Jesus Christ has begun a work in you, and he will continue it until Christ comes back. So the fact that he has yet to come back means that he is or is not still working in you. Is he? He is. Behold the work of God. He is at work in you right now. In other words, he ain't finished with you yet. That's not good English, but that's good news. He ain't finished with you yet so you stand strong against the devil when he tries to tell you that you're too old or you're from the wrong side of the tracks you're either the wrong gender the wrong color or the wrong economic level whatever it is you stand strong against him and you remind him of the story of that 80 year old shepherd in the wilderness who was 40 years removed he thought from his prime only to hear god say no The best is yet to be. Receive again the call of God on your heart. 
He ain't finished with you yet. And receive anew the redemption of God. Receive the redemption of God. Let him redeem you. Let him forgive you. Stand beneath the blood-stained cross of Christ. Some time ago, my wife, Deanlin, and I went out to dinner and had a delightful time. And at the end of the, of the dinner, here comes the attendant, as she was supposed to, with the check. And she put the check and said, you know, I'll come back in just a minute and get your credit card. And we were talking. And right behind her comes an Oak Hills member, uh, somebody who had been across, seating across the restaurant who saw me and came over to say hello. And we had a nice visit. And after we visited for a while, this person said, well, enjoy your dinner. And then he reached down, and you know what he did? You want to guess? He grabbed the check, and he stuck it in his pocket. And he said, I'll take that. Oh, he's such a godly man. <laughs> a wonderful man of God. Just a, an inspiration to all of us. So you know what I did when he took my check and said, I'll take that? You know what I did? I ordered more dessert. <laughs> I let him. I let him take it. He wanted to. Who was I to argue? I let him take it. And so when the attendant came by a few minutes later to pick up the check with the credit card, you know what I said? I pointed at him and I said, he took it. He took it. And she looked over at him and the guy kind of waved. Do you know the Bible says that someday we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account to the way we use our lives. Every thought, every deed, every word, we're going to give an account for it. Now, were it not for Jesus Christ, that thought would terrify me. If you knew my thoughts, my deeds, and every word I've spoken, you'd never let me preach. You wouldn't, and I wouldn't blame you. I'm crooked from head to toe. But because of Jesus Christ... I have absolutely, absolutely no fear of that moment. In fact, I cannot wait for that moment. <laughs> because whenever they produce a list of all my sins, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to point at Jesus. And you know what I'm going to say? He took it. Because he is the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away the sin of the world. Have you let him take yours? Here's the thing about the gospel. While the gospel is free, it's never forced. While it's free, it's never forced. And while it, what the gospel requires from you is the same thing that really the invitation required from the Hebrew people. They could have said no. They could have said, I'm not, not positioning myself beneath the blood of the Lamb. They could have. They could have. But they didn't. And consequently, they were delivered. May you make the same decision they did. For while it's free, it's never forced. Receive anew the redemption of God. So, Lord, this is our prayer that even now with these words are still in our ears, that we could be thankful for the redemption we've received or could, we could be quick to receive the redemption we did not. Help us, Father, to receive the message of the gospel today. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said,
Thank you.